hey there, it's irene lyon. welcome to this video and to this youtube channel and to this world of healing trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity i wanted to give you a little heads up to an article that i just wrote it is uh, 2019 we're into sort of the early part of the year and it is titled this it is titled this nine common human experiences that can be traumatic but are often seen as not it's a bit of a mouthful i'll say that one more time nine common human experiences that can be traumatic but are often seen as not and i'm just going to list them right now and then i'm going to dive into why this is an important topic and why i encourage you to go over to the blog to my blog my website and read through this so the first one near-death experiences so that's one of the common experiences we get um, that we don't think of as being traumatic or potentially traumatic surgery and anesthesia so in other words this could be routine surgery like getting your tonsils out or having anesthetic even for dental surgery so anything where we are being handled by a doctor while we are under can lead to traumatic stress after the fact the next one premature birth and or highly traumatic birth now this is actually we we often don't think of these things if a baby is born and let's say they survive and maybe they were preemie or there was a really traumatic c-section or trouble getting the kiddo out and the child survives which is wonderful we don't think oh maybe something is still lingering in their system and from the work i've done and a lot of the early trauma work early developmental trauma work i've studied and i do with my clients um, to help them heal i can tell you right now that this is a category that is a very important especially in our western world where we keep babies alive after they've had traumatic stress right if we think back into the day when there was maybe a premature birth or there was somewhere where the kid was stuck they the child wouldn't survive and often nor would the mother right so now what we're having is these situations where children are living and that's wonderful as are the parents hopefully the mother and the consequences of that trauma aren't being looked at and dealt with so again that's another one the next one in utero stress in utero stress so this is what happens to um, the unborn child when they are inside um, of mom in the womb in the uterus area and mom let's just say has got a lot going on a lot of stress doesn't necessarily have to be her being abused it could just be high work you know high work levels we know now from um, the research post 9 11 in the united states after the 9 11 incident that mothers that were um, carrying while that occurred their little ones showed greater signs of stress reactivity after they were born so that is something else that i talk about in this article in utero stress next one parental depression and or a parent that is unwell and unable to truly care for and connect with their kids so this is actually huge so parental depression we could just say parental mental illness or mental unwellness or the parent not being in a good state themselves when we are not in a good state ourselves and we have a little one that we need to take care of the little one feels that they know that we're not fully there even if we're there the energy that a child feels from its caregiver is in many ways more important than who it is so by that i mean we always talk about the parents and that's important but it could even be if the little child is being taken care of by an auntie or a grandparent or a nanny whoever that child has we want to make sure that that caregiver can connect and attune to the child and i'll post another vlog below on um, what it takes to raise a healthy human and i'll go into that that concept of this attachment this connection i'll actually post a few things down below because it's an important topic so that's another one um oh and the other thing too just a little side note is we tend to think that traumatic stress is physical abuse verbal abuse sexual abuse high level adversity and neglect and while that is true yes what we also know is when a little one has the slightest misattunement 
daily, every day, by the hour, by the minute, over that first three years of their life when their nervous system is really being built up and they're learning what's called self-regulation, when that's slightly off just by a bit, the little one feels that and that can cause confusion, that can cause anxiety at that little, little person level. And then this is what we're seeing a lot right now, especially in the Western world, is a lot of kiddos with a lot of anxiety and teenagers with anxiety, depression, and everything was fine in the household. There wasn't this kind of high level abuse and adversity, but it's this slight misattunement. It could even be mom and dad who are so stressed and, and um, just not attentive because they are so worried about their jobs or maybe they're high achievers and they just don't know how to connect and sit down and be with their with their children with their infants so that's a very important one the next one is societal i call this decencies societal decencies and cultural conditioning now this is another huge one in our western populations in our countries in our industrialized nations i won't get into this completely but it's this kind of concept that children should be seen and not heard this sort of stiff british upper lip don't show any emotion don't show tears don't so don't show anger and then also our conditionings that have led us to do things like um you know not feel good about passing gas like let's be honest it we tell people to excuse themselves or to say pardon me or you know there's jokes around our bodily functions that really are just bodily functions and so when we've had these things ingrained in us from a young age we actually start to not value and honor what our body needs to do to stay healthy so again that was social societal decencies and cultural conditioning now the next one is intergenerational trauma this means and I kind of touched on it when I mentioned the 9-11 incident, but we know this from a lot of the research done with um, Holocaust survivors and them having children and, of course, them, their children having children. And these children of those of those survivors and the grandchildren, even though they aren't have never been exposed to that kind of atrocity, the genetic can carry with them if it's not worked with in a sort of biological neurophysiological way so we know that it's very common for these um let's say grandchildren of holocaust survivor survivors to have high levels of anxiety and i'll post another interview i did with one of my mentors kathy kane where we talk about that i'll timestamp it so you can click on that link and just watch where we talk about that so intergenerational trauma it is real the research is showing that um, and then the last one, not the last one, um, almost the last one, is the need to be always perfect. This is a big one in our culture, to be perfect and perform for love and attention. So this is, to me, again, something I see all the time. I was, I was raised in a school system where, of course, a lot of my friends were praised. They were given rewards when they got good grades. You know, you got this much money for an A, you got this much money for a B. If you didn't, you were, you know, limited TV access, like all these ways that we kind of play with reward and rules and punishment and, and you know, conditional love, really. And it isn't to say that we don't want to teach our kids um, how to do well and how to prosper and how to work hard but when there are conditions attached to it we run a risk of that individual that human only knowing how to do things from external perspectives right from external perspectives and i won't get into all the examples i can think of for this but i see this in a lot of clients and a lot of people i know where their motivation to do stuff whether that's work or just take care of their surroundings or even take care of themselves is predicated on the fact that in order to and when they did that when they were young it's because they were told how great they were or they were pra praised or rewarded and this is a very dangerous thing and um, i think it's really important that we understand that we need to offer guidance to children that isn't around these conditions. There's a great book actually called uh, Nurture Shock. I'll post it below also. It was written by Poe Bronson. 
And one of the things that he talks about, I think it's one of the first chapters, is if we tell a child how awesome they are at something, we're basically damaging them. Doesn't mean to um, put attention to them and say, wow, like how was that for you to win that award or get that good grade or work so hard to achieve that, but to not shower them with praise because doing that then makes it such that this cycle is set up where they're only doing that for that validation, for that reward. Bottom line, we want our, our body, our connection to self to be driven internally, right? And that gets set up really young. All right, the next one, and this is a little different, is past life trauma. So this is something that came into my awareness in the early 2000s. Again, I link a resource here where a psychiatrist, actually a medical doctor psychiatrist, stumbled across um, past life trauma. And that meaning not intergenerational, but if you believe in soul, if you believe in spirit, if you believe in life past this dimension, that when we die, our soul moves on somewhere else. And that somewhere else could be in another person down the line. And so if we have got soul in our system or an old soul in our system that had traumatic events in other lifetimes, it's possible, and we're seeing this, that that traumatic event from another lifetime can be somehow playing out in this current lifetime. The doctor's name is Brian Weiss. I will, again, in the article, I have his link. Fascinating book called Many Lives, Many Masters that I read in like two days. It was amazing. So I highly recommend looking into that. Now, all of these experiences I have outlined based on my experience working with clients in private practice over 15 plus years, and just sort of starting to see as we piece together and do the mystery work of why is this person unwell? Why is this person not recovering with sort of general lifestyle improvement, behavior change, and they weren't subjected to serious abuse, neglect, adversity, we got to look at these lists and often, and I'll, this is what often will be happening. I'll be working with a client and we're trying to figure out this piece. Like, why do they always have this stress reaction or why do they have trouble here or there? And then sometimes it takes a few weeks or even a few months before they go, Oh, that's right. My mom said I almost died in the hospital because of an infection when I was 18 months old or, Oh, yeah, I actually had to go live with my aunt when I was two because my parents um, got into a car accident and they couldn't take care of me. But even though I was taken care of by a loving, let's say, family member, there was still that rupture and attachment to the parents. But because, of course, everybody was okay, um, nobody thinks about it. Same with surgeries. Um, I can tell you right now from po processing my own surgeries, there is a lot wrapped up when you are little and you go into say a tonsillectomy and you don't understand what's actually happening. If nobody took the time to really explain and if the nurses weren't not nice and if there was these bright lights and maybe you struggled a bit when they put you under and they strapped you down, all of that gets trapped in the system. And up until this point in time, we have not had the conversations nor the history intake of these sorts of experiences. So this, again, this video is just a very quick overview of those nine points. I highly recommend you go over to the blog and read the full article. As people were reading this article and I was getting feedback, a lot of people were like, oh my God, this occurred to me, this occurred to me, this makes so much sense. I never would have thought that this would have an impact on my current health. And here's the thing, until we actively look at this stuff, get educated on all these potentials for what could cause traumatic stress to get trapped in the system, we won't know. So by having this education, by going through this list, by really kind of assessing and feeling into these pieces, these nine experiences, you might uncover something that you didn't even think of. And it might not come right away, it might come in a few weeks, or maybe it comes in a dream, or maybe, you see something or you see a family member that reminds you, oh yeah, that summer I almost drowned in the lake. Um, so I hope this has been a, a useful 
um, entry point into ways in which we can trap traumatic stress when we often don't think of these things as being traumatic at all. All right, take very good care. Thank you for being here and we will see you next time. Bye.